tonight. Tonight we're going to continue in our uh, Gospel of Mark series, so take out your Bible with me. Let's open up the Bible together and look at God's Word in Mark chapter 6. We're going to look at Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. That's where the lesson text is going to come this morning. If you can remember last time, it's been, I don't know how many weeks, three weeks or so, uh, since we have dived into this uh, together. But if you can remember from last time, uh, we looked at how, uh, we looked at three separate stories um, of how uh, the, the Messiah, Jesus, is, is presented as one who has great power. He is one who has great authority. He is one who has uh, extraordinary compassion on the weak and defenseless and sinners and the undesirable of society. Um, and specifically, last time we looked at uh, the, the power uh, that this Jesus has and the way that Mark uh, wants us to, uh, to see his power and understand how mighty and awesome he is. Those three stories, we looked at the, the story of Jesus calming a, a storm uh, a mighty, a mighty windstorm, saying, "Peace, be still, be calm." Over it, he has power over nature. Uh, he, he has, he has power to calm a storm. He also has power over the demonic. He has power uh, within himself to cast out a legion of demons uh, within an individual and restore them to uh, sanity. He has this kind of power, and he also has power over death itself. He can raise those who experience death again to new life, so they experience uh, life anew, life afresh. He has power over nature, power over demons, power over death. This Jesus that Mark is presenting to us is one of extraordinary power, and Mark wants us to see that. But in the section that we're going to look at tonight, we're introduced to another kind of power that we see in the first part of chapter 6. It's a power which causes this mighty healing and transformative and renewing power of the Messiah Jesus to come to a screeching halt, to stop, to cease. Now, that's not to say that this power that we're going to talk about tonight is greater than the power of Jesus. Jesus is God. Jesus has the authority over heaven and earth. Jesus can do whatever it is that he wills. Uh, but it's a power that Jesus, being God, will not work through when it's present because it's the root, this power that we're going to uncover and talk about tonight, it's the root of all of that which is evil. The root of evil is this power that we're going to talk about tonight. And here's the power. The power is the power of unbelief. The power of unbelief. And if you want to give the message a title tonight, if you're taking notes, uh, you can title the message, The Power of Unbelief. Now, before we dive into this section together, I want to warn you up front, I think this is necessary to say, uh, I want to say that this, this message, it might come across as a little negative. Uh, and, and I don't think that's a bad thing. That, that's because the nature of the passage that we're going to look at tonight carries kind of a negative tone to it. Uh, but I want to encourage you as as always, as we open up God's Word, to view what we talk about through the lens of the, of the fully revealed character of God that we see through Christ Jesus our Lord. I encourage you to see this text, to see what we say tonight through the lens of God's grace. You know, sometimes God is very negative in Scripture, and sermons can be negative as well. Uh, but that's because God wants to warn us, to sharpen us, so that we can be the best servants of His that we can possibly be and to keep us from falling away, to keep us from being all that He wants us to be and experience a joy in Jesus that far surpasses any other kind of manufactured joy within the world. So, 
I want to ask the question first before we dive into this passage. What is unbelief? Let's define our terms here for a moment. What are we talking about when, what am I, what am I meaning when I say unbelief? What is unbelief? Unbelief as the Bible tells us, is a disposition of the heart that looks at God and whispers, I don't believe who you say that you are. I don't think that you are the person that you claim to, the claim to be. I don't believe that you are who you say that you are. You're say, you say, God, that you're holy, and unique and set apart from all else, I don't see it. I don't believe it. God, you say that you deserve reverence from us. You say that you deserve to be feared and worshipped. I don't think so. You say that you are a consuming fire. Yeah, right. Likewise, you say that you have a heart full of compassion for weak sinners. Doubt it. You say that you'll never leave me nor you'll forsake me if I'm in you. I don't believe that. I can't believe that. You say that I'm valuable enough to give your life for, but I'm not so sure. Unbelief. Unbelief says to God in words or by actions, you're a liar. You are a liar. You, you aren't who you claim to be, and your words can't be trusted. You're a liar, God. It's a lack of trust in God as He has revealed Himself to be within the world. Uh, we see it within uh, Genesis chapter 3. Uh, the first sin of humanity that was committed when they ate of the forbidden fruit. Uh, they didn't trust uh, that God's definition of right and wrong, good and evil, uh, was the best way to do things. Uh, we see the same kind of unbelief in the Israelites out in the desert. Uh, they, um, uh, they didn't trust that God was going to fight their battles. They're, they didn't trust that God was going to protect them and give them... Um, sustenance and protection and, and a land and fulfill His promise. They didn't trust in that. They persisted in unbelief. And that's what unbelief is. It's saying, God, I hear what you're saying, but I just don't trust it. I don't trust who you claim to be. And unbelief, it, it manifests itself in all different kinds of ways uh, within our life, within, our, within it, our, our different scenarios and circumstances in life. It reveals itself possibly when I'm hurting. It reveals itself when, when I have to make sacrifices in my faith journey. Unbelief may reveal itself when the cares and riches in the world seem more important than Christ and His king, kingdom and the advancement of the gospel. It manifests itself when I would rather do things my way. Unbelief manifests itself. It comes about in so many different spheres and scenarios and circumstances within my life. Unbelief is a real threat in the Christian life. That's why the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Hebrew, the, the author of Hebrews says, Take care. He says, Guard your heart, because this world will throw so many things at you that tempt you to doubt in God's presence, His holiness, His grace, His mercy, and His love. I was listening to a preacher one time that said, out of all the things that we fear, we fear a great many things, uh, but out of, all of the, out of all of the things that we fear, unbelief should be at the very top of that list. If you fear anything that's worthwhile, fear unbelief. 
And the power that unbelief exerts over the life of the Christian is, uh, is one that causes the power of Jesus, the mighty power that we see, that we read about in the book of Mark, come to a halt. Uh, and, and that's what our text in Mark is all about. It's about the power of this unbelief. So let's look at the text together, Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Let's read together verses 1 through 6. Verse 1 says, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus, in verse 4, said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his home, in, in his own, uh, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And then in verse 5, And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. So here we see Jesus... Uh, leaving Capernaum, uh, and as, as, as he was in chapter 5, he's, he's, leaving, he's leaving that city and he's coming to his hometown, which is Na Nazareth, about 20 or so miles away. Uh, Na Nazareth was the place that Jesus had grown up in. Uh, many texts in the, in the Gospels say that. Um, and uh, Nazareth was just a very small town. It was a very insignificant place. The Old Testament doesn't mention it at all. Very little mention of it in extra-biblical sources and writings. We know that it exists. It, we know that it it existed, but it just wasn't a prominent place. It was a, it, it was a very small town in the hills of Galilee. And if you grew up, uh, if you yourself, if you grew up in a small town or in like a rural kind of cultural, cultural setting, you know how much tighter knit of a community uh, that kind of situation is. Uh, my wife is from in between Pikeville and Dunlap, Tennessee, in the Sequatchie Valley. Uh, and Dunlap's a uh, town of like uh, a little under 5,000 people or so. Pikeville has like uh, 1,000 people. And she associated with those more so in Pikeville um, than, uh, than Dunlap. She went to Bledsoe County uh, High School. Uh, but, you know, whenever we go and visit her parents there, we almost, we, it's kind of a joke. Whenever we go into Walmart, well, we say, okay, how many people are we going to see that you know when we, when we walk in here and that know you? And, and it's usually about five people. Uh, whenever we go into Walmart and see um, all the people that she's acquainted with and went to high school with. Um, so then that's kind of the situation that we see within this text. Jesus comes to his hometown. It's a small town. Everybody knows him, uh, and he knows them. Uh, they knew, they, they know Jesus. They knew what he was like as a boy. They saw him as he grew up. Uh, they, they saw him as a teenager. Uh, they saw him as a young adult. Uh, as, as the text mentions, as a carpenter, it was, it's likely that they maybe did business with him early in his adult life. Uh, so the townspeople here in Nazareth, they have ingrained in their minds in the image of Jesus running around as a child and playing with other children. They, when they look at this Jesus, they have that image of him scarred in their minds. Like this is kid Jesus here. They see, they, they see him possibly as a teenager who sat beside his brothers and sisters and father and mother in the synagogue on, on the Sabbath day. They see that picture of Jesus when Jesus in his power and authority and compassion comes back to Nazareth and proclaims the word and performs miracle. This is the Jesus that they see. And they see, they, they know this Jesus as, as probably the guy that uh, made a table for their family to set their lamp on at night. They know this Jesus. They're familiar with him. They grew up with him. They saw him grow up and reach maturity. So they already have their minds made up about Jesus because they know him. 
because they know his whole life. And they probably say, they probably look at him and say, you know, he's not anybody special. He's, he's just, uh, he, he's just the, the, the carpenter guy, uh, the carpenter's son, as the, as the parallel account in Matthew says. He, he's just the carpenter that we've known for years and years. We know his father. We know his mother. We know his, mo- we know his brothers. We know his sisters. You know, he can't, this, this person, this Jesus that we know, he can't possibly be someone great. So when Jesus teaches in their synagogue, uh, he comes to them on the Sabbath day and proclaims the word, the message about the kingdom. Probably he said the same thing that he did earlier in Mark, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. It has entered into the world. So when Jesus teaches the message and proclaims the gospel of the kingdom, they're absolutely amazed. They're astonished the text says, at his teaching. They're astonished at how much wisdom that this man has. Uh, Because this is Jesus. This is the kid Jesus that they knew growing up. Look at him teach now. He can, he, he, he can expound upon the Word of God, and he teaches with one that has this, almost this divine kind of like authority. And they wonder, they're astonished at the miracles, the power that is within him. So they're amazed, they marvel, they're astonished at this teaching, at this Jesus. But their astonishment isn't a reaction that stemmed from belief. They're not like those who see Jesus, who see his power, his authority, and his compassion and say, whoa, he's someone special, he's someone great. No, no. Their kind of astonishment was different. It was an astonishment that stemmed not from belief and trust, but it was an astonishment that stemmed rather from contempt. The text says they took offense at him. And the reason why is because they knew him. They know this Jesus. They, they were offended at this. this. This is Jesus. This is Jesus that we all know. He's a local yokel that has been in our town, that has grown up amongst us. This isn't God. <laughs> well, I know uh, I used to babysit this Jesus, so probably not. But, uh, you know, this isn't anyone special. Probably the attitude that the people in Nazareth had as Jesus proclaims the message and uh, performs these miracles. So their hearts, what's going on is their hearts are looking at this Jesus square in the face even though they could blatantly see with their eyes his power, his authority, and his compassion. And they said in their hearts, this guy's full of himself. He's a liar. You're you're claiming to be something that we know that you are not. And we have no trust in who you claim to be. That's unbelief. That's unbelief. When your heart looks at this Jesus as presented in the Gospels and And upon seeing his power, authority, and compassion, when your heart looks at him and sees him in all of his grandeur and wonder, and you look at him and you say by your words or maybe even by your actions, I don't trust who you claim to be. I don't trust you even though I can see who you are, even though you've revealed yourself to me. That is unbelief. And notice with me the, the, um, Jesus' reaction here in verse 6. It says, he marveled. The text said he marveled because of their unbelief. Now, this is significant because this is, it's, it's the only instance in Mark that amazement, that astonishment, that uh, marveling, wonder is ascribed to Jesus. Uh, there's one account in the story of, uh, of, this, of Jesus and the centurion in, in the Gospel of Mac, Matthew in which Jesus um, is said to have marveled, but, but that was because of a person's great faith. The only instance in which Jesus marvels and is astonished, I mean, we're talking about God, the God that made heaven and earth, 
is astonished. He is amazed at unbelief when they see him in all of his beauty and they see who he is and they don't believe, but they rather have contempt and they're offended at him. That causes his amazement. Um, it's the only time that we see it in, in Mark. So the townspeople here in Nazareth are astonished at uh, Jesus Christ. And, and in turn, uh, kind of ironic, Jesus is astonished at them. He's ast- they're, G- they're astonished at Jesus. Jesus is astonished at them. And the result was that Jesus' mighty healing and transformative power, it was greatly hindered. He could do no mighty works in that town. Not because he, he, he wasn't able to, of course. I mean, he, could, he, he can do whatever it is that he wills. Um, but this unbelief that we see amongst these people, it hinders the power of God. Um, it makes it come to a screeching halt. So what is this story teaching us? What, what can we learn from these first six ver- verses? in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. The story in this part of the life of Jesus, it's intended to describe to us the power that unbelief has in this world and in our world today. Unbelief, what it does, it blocks out that which is obvious. Unbelief blocks out the obvious. I mean, it was blatantly obvious that Jesus was someone special. He performed miracles amongst them, the text says. He has this divine kind of wisdom uh, that they recognize as superior. Uh, they, they, They could see with their own two eyes the power that this man Jesus has and the wonders that he could perform, but they were blind. They were completely blind to the truth because their hearts were full of unbelief. And that's what unbelief does within our life. It blocks out that which is obviously true. When I look at truth square in the face, I say, that has no significance for me. That's what unbelief does. And, you know, I think of those with, uh, immediately, I think of those with an atheistic kind of uh, worldview. I, I say, how, how in the world, how in the world could someone look out into this creation? You know, I'm not a scientist. I don't, I don't claim to um, be extremely wise uh, or, or knowledgeable, but how in the world could you not look into creation, especially when you look, say, under a microscope at the complexities that exist within the world, how systems are so intricate and complex that if you just take out one of those microscopic little components, then the entire thing would just cease to function How in the world could you look at specimens such as these and conclude that God does not exist? Likewise, how in the world can you look at the Bible, a a book that is unified, is diversified, is complex and simple, all at the same time that points toward one person, one man, as the climactic figure within all of human history, Jesus Christ, and could not conclude that this is God's revelation to mankind. How in the world could you not see that? That's the power of unbelief. That's what it does. That's what this text is saying. Unbelief looks at what is obviously true right in the face and says it could never be. What else does unbelief do? Unbelief makes up silly excuses at the same time. As looking in our story, you know, the, uh, the people within Nazareth, they had an excuse for not believing in Jesus. Their their excuse for not believing was that they knew him from childhood. This is little boy kid Jesus. You know, he's not God. He's not he can't possibly someone special, be someone special even though that they saw his mighty works. 
Even though they could see that he had the power of God to heal the sick, to cast out these demonic forces, that he had power over nature. You know, the fact that he was from that town and uh, the fact that people knew him and saw him growing up, that shouldn't have mattered in the grand scheme of things. Because even if you, I mean, I just use it for an example, if Titus started performing miracles, even though he's my son and he's just a little kid, I would probably conclude, hmm, okay, something's going on here. <laughs> Something uh, different is, uh, has, has come about, uh, but that was not their reaction. They should have seen him for who he was because he is revealing himself to them. But that's what unbelief does. It makes up silly excuses, even though what's blatantly true and obvious is staring at it in the face. Um, parable that Jesus gives, the parable of the great banquet in Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24. Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 24, it says this, When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had, invited, who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, eh, I bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, Well, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to, I must go to examine them. I got to go look at uh, my oxen there. Please have me excused. And another said, nah, I've married a wife, and therefore I, I can't. I can't do it. I can't come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blame, blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men the ones that made excuses, who were invited, shall taste my banquet. These people who receive the invitation of the Lord Jesus Christ, who see Him in all of His beauty, but then begin to make excuses. I, I've, got, I've got several uh, farm animals. I've got to go look at them. I married a wife. I've got to go uh, tend to her. All of these things uh, that... Um, that they elevate um, to a level um, of importance that's greater than the call that they've received. This is, um, this is a condemnation uh, that Jesus is giving upon these people, those that make excuses. And this is the power of unbelief. Uh, when unbelief hears the call, when it hears the call of God, when it sees God and all of His glory and all of His beauty to come and serve and sacrifice and live for Him and His glory, and then it makes up silly excuses. And it chases after inferior hopes and dreams and, and, and pleasures more than the superior hope and dream and pleasure of living in Jesus and growing in Him and being like Him. And that person persists in unbelief. Tonight... You know, if you find yourself uh, always making excuses, sometimes I do this, if you find yourself making excuses to serve, to sacrifice for the cause of Jesus, then you may very well be allowing unbelief to reign in your life, because this is what unbelief does. It makes up silly excuses. So the power of God is quenched, and the gospel of Jesus Christ is not advanced. What else does unbelief do? What is its power as we see within this text? Unbelief produces apathy. It produces a lack of interest, a lack of zeal, a lack of passion for the cause of Jesus Christ. You know, as we look at this text, the people in Nazareth, their, their initial astonishment, they were amazed initially at Jesus, His wisdom and His mighty works. But what did that lead to? It didn't lead to action. It didn't lead to submission. It didn't lead to repentance. It didn't lead to obedience. It 
didn't lead them to a desire to want to learn uh, about Jesus and grow from him. It led to offense. It led to apathy. You know, even though they saw him, even though they saw how mighty he was, and they had all the evidence in the world that pointed to the fact that he was God, they refused to be ignited with this kind of passion and zeal uh, and pursue the cause of the kingdom. That's what unbelief does. That's the power of unbelief exerted over one who allows it to come into their life. It extinguishes the flame of passion. It puts out desire and zeal to be like Jesus. And it's not just a problem that we see within Mark chapter 6. Apathy, unbelief, is a problem that we see in the, Lord, in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Several years ago, I was doing an internship, and um, I was assigned to interview 10 preachers in the Brotherhood and, and ask them uh, several questions. But one of the questions was, uh, what's one of the greatest problems that you see within the church that's facing the church today? And um, it was like eight out of 10 of them, something, something like that. I can't exactly remember, but it was, it was the majority of them. Most of them said um, the biggest, one of the biggest problems in the church today is apathy, a lack of interest, a lack of passion, a lack of zeal, a lack of interest in growing and wanting to be like Jesus, a surface level interest in discipleship, in Christian growth, in advancing their faith, a contentment in where they are currently, and no passion and zeal to advance forward. And that um, is very true a, a lot of the time. In, in, in church, uh, we, I don't think we're immune to that a lot of the time. We need to believe. We need to believe we need to see Jesus for all of He is in his, in, his, in his beauty and His grandeur, to see Him and see that uh, we have everything. We have everything at our fingertips and, um, and, and live to serve and sacrifice for Him. We need to be a church that steps out in faithful obedience and live like Jesus in this world because so many people need to see, uh, to see Him through us. Um, but that's, a, that's a, a problem that very well um, could infect our life if we're not guarding our heart. Uh, unbelief, which, which produces this lack of zeal, this lack of motivation. It produces apathy. And then lastly tonight, as we see within the text, unbelief smothers the supernatural. It smothers the supernatural. Especially in the Gospel of Mark, uh, more so... I think more so in Mark, we see that Mark emphasizes the fact that Jesus' mighty works are in response to faith, to faithful obedience. We see previously in Mark chapter 5, verse 34, it says, And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And later in Mark, in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, it says, And Jesus said to him, If you can... All things are possible for one who believes. When true faith, when true trust and belief are, is, is present, you know, there's no end to the possibilities of the things that God can accomplish through that, through weak, humble people who step out with courage and boldness and faith and passion and zeal in the present. But when faith is absent, unbelief reigns within the heart. And it smothers the supernatural power of God and causes His glorious work to come to a screeching halt. That's the power of unbelief. It blocks that which is obviously true within our life. It makes silly excuses. It produces apathy and it smothers the power of God. It smothers the supernatural. But as we close tonight on the positive side of all that, when we truly believe when we truly say in our hearts, God, I trust you. I trust who you say that you are, even though I can't see you, even though I can't feel you. I trust in your promise that you have made to me. Then the mighty deeds 
that God can accomplish through us are limitless. And this tonight as we close, I want you to ask yourself, how would Jesus react if he saw you today? What kind of marveling would uh, come over Jesus upon seeing you and your life and your level of faith? Would he marvel at you because of unbelief? Or would he marvel at you for the level of faith and sacrifice and obedience and submission and repentance that you're showing? The message is yours tonight. If anyone is hurting or anyone needs prayers, the invitation is extended to you. You can come forward uh, and make that known. Also, if you don't know Jesus Christ, as F.H. mentioned in the first part of his sermon this morning, you can know him. Uh, the water back here is ready. Uh, you can uh, believe upon him. Uh, you can uh, repent of your sins and do a 180 in your life. You can come forward right now, confess your faith publicly, uh, to this body of believers and be immersed in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins and know the joy of the Lord, beginning a relationship with Him. Tonight, if you have any need, why don't you come forward as we stand and as we sing. Oh,